So the next speaker is uh, Felix Saint-Grand from last CNRS, and uh, he will talk about uh, verification of uh, autonomous robots and how can uh, we do that. So well, thank you very much. You. Uh, first of all, if you see me playing with my phone, I'm not tweeting or Facebooking at uh, the same time. I'm just trying to control this presentation with, uh, with uh, the phone. Okay, so this talk is about uh, trying to verify autonomous system, and I, I have a roboticist approach because I'm more roboticist guy than a, a, a formal validation and verification guy, and uh, I will explain why I, I, I want to take a, a roboticist uh, bottom-up approach. Okay, so. Basically, I'm interested in autonomous system. I mean, you know, you can see the autonomous system nowadays covers a lot of different uh, uh, platforms. I put some uh, some agricultural robots here. You have uh, one uh, tractor here, or another one from uh, our friends uh, Nayo. Um, but the point here is that uh, most of these systems uh, they are autonomous indeed, or they try to be as autonomous as possible. But a large part of their development is actually the software. I mean, of course, you know, you have a mechanical aspect, electronic aspect, but the software part is really important and most of the software nowadays is not really validated and verified and when I say validated and verified during this talk I mean formally I mean with some mathematical or logical model and um, as you all know basically there are some consequences of uh, the reason why the systems are not perfect uh, there are already a couple of uh, little accidents in autonomous uh, vehicle or not not completely autonomous but at least they try to be but uh, they do mistake and uh, my point here is that I, I'm not saying that I will be able to prevent this, but I, I'm at least making uh, the point that uh, for some already existing systems like trains or planes, I mean, in Toulouse, uh, you can't ignore that. Uh, basically, we are already using uh, the formal validation and verification of the software. I mean, uh, there are already some techniques which are being developed, and I want to see you know, if those techniques can be applied to uh, autonomous system. Of course, those systems are not fully autonomous, as you all know, but you know we are quite complex, and uh, that's what I'm trying to do. So, when I mention software validation and verification, basically we usually need the model. You need some kind of formal model. I mean, a uh, model can be. Um, of different type, uh, uh, IO automata, Petrinet, time automata, uh, linear temporal logic, whatever uh, you know, type of uh, model you can you, you you may want to use. You need models, and you use you need also some validation verification techniques. Uh, those techniques, you know, are, the well-known one are model checking. So basically, you are doing state exploration of your system, and you try to to, to prove that the property is satisfied or not. There are also some techniques with uh, using more. Uh, more logical aspect like fear improving or set solving. And among these techniques, some of them are complete, so they will give you a definitive answer if uh, yes or no, the property is satisfied or not. But most of them are you know, making approximation, and some are even using statistical, uh, statistical aspect. Okay, so why do I focus on a, on a bottom-up approach? Well, there are a number of uh, things here. If you consider, uh, you know, I would say a classical architecture where you have the decisional level here with planning, acting, monitoring, observing, all the, you know, the decision you, you, you want your system to take, and the lower level part, which is more the functional part, where you have like the different components which are controlling the robot, which are doing the motion planning, the perception, and things like that. Well, my argument is that, first of all, most of uh, these uh, uh, systems here, they already have models. I mean, we can argue about that uh, later on if you want, but there are already some models and there are already some techniques you, which you can deploy to validate and verify. Um, and this is apart from learned model. We have seen that learned model are actually, you know, they are, they are a domain apart. We need to take care of that, but you know, I don't have time in 20 minutes to address this. But my point here is that uh, uh, at the higher level, usually you have already some uh, some uh, model, but at the lower level, you don't have much models. I mean, you don't have really models which you can use to formally validate uh, and verify your system. And that's where I want uh, I want you to focus uh, this presentation and also my work. And another point I want to make uh, clear is that uh, if you try to prove some property at a higher level, but on your lower level system, you don't have you know, guarantee of what the system is doing, you are just building on quicksand. I mean, things we are going to fail anyway. So, yes, so where do I get formal models for this functional, um, this, uh, the functional layer of these uh, different robots here? Well, the thing is that uh, 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 
the approach I'm proposing is that you can already see that graphically uh, all of these systems are different, but they kind of use the same type of uh, drawing here, boxes and, and things like that. And that's the whole point. I mean, basically, at last, for the last 30 years almost, uh, we have been using a, a, a tool which is really, a, you know, it's a model-driven software engineering tool. I mean, there is nothing really, you know, uh, magic about it. And this tool is called Genome, for those of you who know. And it's, it's a tool we use to develop every single component in this architecture, in this example of, uh, we will, uh, I will present a little bit in more detail after. So keep in mind that, uh, you know, all the functional level components here, all of these different box here with their octagons here, they are being developed with one specific tool, which is this Genome tool. And how does this work? Well, basically, each of these tools is an instance of this, uh, of this uh, system here. I don't really have time to go into the detail, but this is basically a program where if you have you know, input output, so you, have, you, have, you, can, you can send requests to start some activity and you get reports when those activities are being, are being, uh, 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 are being finished. Uh, you have also some uh, internal data structure which represents what, what are the current uh, state variable of your, of your components of interest. You can have also uh, ports you are reading in or ports you are producing out to share data structure with, uh, with other components. And then you can also have a number of execution tasks, periodic, which are uh, with, with a period or, or, or cyclic without, without a period. And those execution tasks are usually responsible for the, the processing, the longer processing. I mean, uh, the services which re require longer time, like your motion planning or your um, det obstacle detection uh, or whatever, you know, longer processing you want to take care in this component. Now, the point here is that this, uh, any components is organized along these lines here. You can, of course, vary the number of execution tasks or services or things like that. But for the complex services, we, we specify them using an automata. So this is already starting to be more formal. But this automata is quite simple. I mean, uh, every roboticist at last is at least able to use it. You have always a start state, and then you have, in every state, you have some C code you are going to execute. Okay, so that's uh, actually my, my, my next slide. But in every state here, you have actually some C code you execute, and this C code, when executing, is going to return some value which tells you in which state you are going to do transition. Okay, so that's you know nothing really, nothing really fancy, but keep in mind again that uh, all of these systems are basically you know organized along uh, this uh, architecture here, about this uh, model of components here. That uh, uh, complex services are being are being deployed using automata, and in each state of this automata, you have the C code which you want to use to implement the function you want to um, to have in your system. So. Really writing any of this module here, module here, as I showed earlier, is really, you know, ends up to be to specify, you know, the, the internal data structures, what are the ports you want to, uh, to have in and out, what are the execution tasks you will be defining, what are the services and what are the automata, and for each of the automata, the C code. So that's actually the way we define uh, our components. So you give this specification, okay, and that, and then you give uh, also, as I say, the tasks, the services, and the automata, and the C code which is associated to this. And this automatically, for you know, at least two middleware, this produce, I mean, this gives you the components to run on the robot. And it insists on this, it is automatic, automatically synthesized. So my point here is that the user just have to give this specification give also the C code which is associated to the state of the various automata which will be running, and automatically you get the components. Again, I can go in more detail with you if you have, uh, if, if, uh, after the presentation, but in 20 minutes I can't really go in more details, but the same way we synthesize the component automatically for any robotics application we develop, okay, then we can also use it to synthesize formal models. And those formal models are equivalent to the components which have been synthesized automatically. So here, if you do this, I mean, if any of you, you know, do this specification and associate uh, some C code else here where we also have worst case execution time, basically all of this you get for free. I mean, the components, you get it for free with all the code which gets it running and also the formal model, you get it for free because I, I am the one who did the template here and I'm, I'm, I and my students, sorry. Uh, I'm the one who did the templates here to synthesize for this model. Okay, so 
And what is actually, what end up into the formal specification? Well, everything. I mean, every single thing which I presented in this uh, uh, architecture for any components here end up into the, uh, uh, the formal model apart from the code which is inside your, uh, your, your C function, which we model with a worst case execution time. And I will explain why uh, later. Okay, so let me give you an example. I mean, after all, it's a robotics uh, conference. So, so this is a robot we have at last. It's not an agricultural robot, but uh, it likes to play in the field, as you can see. And um, this is mini. It can go eight meters per second, so that's quite fast. It's not, a, it's not an autonomous vehicle, as you can see, but it has a lot of commonality. For example, you know, it has a GPS, it has a gyro, it has an IMU. I'm not going to go into more detail. And it has also a very interesting sensor, which you have seen on every autonomous car except the Tesla, because uh, Tesla don't want to use them. But it's called a Velodyne, and it's actually a LiDAR. I mean, you're probably familiar with that. And this is actually a, a picture of what the LiDAR see. I mean, what the, the, um, the, the blue and red uh, square here are actually the occupancy grid map, which I compute from the LiDAR. Anyway, I, I wanted to insist on this, uh, on this uh, um, sensor here because it has some interesting feature. It, it's quite complex to use, but it's very powerful. But the way you implement, you know, how do you are going to use a LiDAR, you have to actually define, the, you know, the number of tasks to do it because while you are moving, let's say you are moving five meters per second and you are taking a 10 hertz um, a 10 hertz uh, uh, scan. Basically, while you are moving, you have moved 50 centimeters uh, at the, between the beginning and the end of the scan. So you have to re-register all the uh, all the dots in the in the in the first frame of your of your of your, of your scan. The point I want to make is that this sensor, you know, alone, which is probably you know one of the most important one in this uh, experiment here, is quite complex to use. So this is you know what I do when I when I play with the robot, uh, uh, you know, in the parking lot of LAS. So this is actually the parking lot. I'm moving from place to place. I'm nothing really fancy. I'm using just a potential field uh, uh, avoidance uh, navigation. But um, uh, what, so you can see that actually the LiDAR data are being collected here. And uh, basically, I build an occupancy grid map. And then you know I move away from obstacle, and I am uh, attracted by obstacle. OK. So the, the architecture which I've put together to get this running is here. So those are nine components. Uh, so there is the one which is leading, dealing with the with the um, with the with the lidar here, the velodyne. I give you some uh, focus on this. So this one produces a point cloud, which is being used for obstacle uh, obstacle avoidance and uh, and uh, navigation. This component is actually the one which is doing the speed reference execution. You have other components, one dealing with the GPS, another one dealing with the EMU. And as you have seen, of all for most of these components, there is an octagon here, which is actually the port the data which the component is producing for other components to use. So for example, these three components here are producing some pose estimation, you know, in their own, uh, this one is acceleration, this one is, uh, you know, the absolute position, and this one is actually uh, the velocity of the wheel. And then I use a Kalman filtering to basically get all of this, all of this information together and get the, you know, the, the, the real position. So this is done by this component here. Now, just to focus on the navigation here, as I say, I'm using a potential field, so I want to reach some you know, some point, I'm going to look at where I am currently, and then I will produce a speed reference, which is going to be executed by the robot. So nothing really fancy, and it's not really my, um, you know, my, the, the, it's, 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 uh, um, it's not really my object of research to do the navigation, it's just that I want to, uh, to use it as, a, as an example. Now, for example, in an experiment like this one, basically you want to make sure that, uh, you, uh, so, so f first of all, I'm able to produce automatically the formal model, I mean one formal model in a, in, a, in a framework which is called BIP, I'm not going to go into more detail on this, but there is like a 27,000 line of formal model here, which is exactly equivalent to, the, to all the components here, okay? And uh, what I want to do, for example, in this experiment is that I want, to make sure that if the Velodyne doesn't produce a point cloud for, let's say, two seconds, I want to make an emergency stop. And I want to make, I mean, I want to, I don't want to program it in C. I could do that, but I have no guarantee that this C code would be called fast enough and when I want it. Now, here I want to make it into the formal model. I'm going to put into the formal model that whenever the, this uh, service of the Velodyne here, which is getting scans at 10 hertz, basically, 
is freeze is frozen for some reason there is a bug or whatever for more than two seconds then i want to stop the robot automatically and this is basically what you see here so the robot is still navigating this is actually the trace of the beep mo of the formal model executing i'm injecting a fault here i'm just saying i'm going to delay by two seconds the scan and you see the robot is stopping and I mean, believe me, when it's stopping, like, you know, uh, art stop zero, I mean, you put zero, zero on the wheel, basically it stops the, the, the way you saw it, just, you know, by breaking uh, very violently. Now, again, I want to insist on this here. What you see here is not, you know, the, the regular genome components uh, executing, it's actually the formal model equivalent to this components which is controlling the robot and again I'm injecting the full the second time here and then you see the robot stopping as an emergency okay so here you know again I'm just trying to make a proof of concept that uh, basically we can use formal model I mean there are already I mean there are already some tools available we can use these models to guarantee some property on some system, on some critical system Another, another verification tool we are using, for example, allow us to check that uh, for some initialization, you know, some sequence of initialization, you are never going to use data from a port before they have been written at least once. Okay, and again, that's you know that's something important to check. And indeed, we by doing it, we found a, we found a bug. Uh, there was a bug actually in the initialization. There was a race condition, which could actually make the robot start to navigate despite the fact that it was not already localized, which is usually bad because it means that you know you are you are you want to go somewhere, but, uh, although you don't really know where you are. And at worst, you can be in a location which is buggy, and uh, then it will do a maximum. Uh, acceleration for no particular reason. So this is the kind of thing you can prove again. And this is, so the first example I show you actually, I show you, sorry, uh, actually was done offline, I mean, uh, online, sorry. It was really controlling the robot as it was moving. But this type of verification here, we do it online, okay? Offline, geez. So again, the first one was actually online. So we were, the model was really controlling the robot. But this verification, we do it uh, offline before the robot even gets started with something. Uh, so this actually is a type of, uh, of property you want to check, but uh, I will go in, I will not go into more detail. Uh, another type of vari validation verification we do is it's with another uh, tool which is called FIAC, which is actually developed by some colleagues at LAS. Again, we can, for example, check that uh, if you send a stop a command to this particular component here, then it will stop in uh, a given amount of time, which is actually 0 0.25 uh, uh, um, uh, second, if I remember properly. Another interesting thing which we are able to show is that, uh, the, uh, and this was actually done with uh, some drones at last, is that uh, you, are, um, you, you, you are able to check that you have enough uh, available uh, power or CPU on your system to be able to run the system safely. Again, you know, if you implement a system and a, and a computer which, is a, uh, which doesn't have enough power to run all the possible codels and with their worst case execution time and the period of uh, execution uh, properly, then you run, uh, you know, you may run in problems where, where basically you will get a delayed uh, speed reference being produced and then the drone or the robot uh, will fail. Okay, so just to conclude, my point here is that, you know, valid I mean, formal validation and verification can be applied to fairly complex systems. I mean, here, you know, I, I'm not saying it was an autonomous car, but it's a fairly complex, you know, robots that uh, we are playing with, okay? My point is that these tools will be usable and adapted by and adaptable, I should say, by roboticists. I mean, uh, if you come, if you go to roboticists and tell them, well, you are going to program this with uh, PetriNet or, uh, or or Time Automata, I mean, chances are that they will look at you with uh, with. Uh, the, uh, with suspicion, I will say. So I, I, I really advocate the fact that we should stick to some existing, uh, you know, uh, software development framework which exists for for robots, and then try to, uh, you know, connect or to harness them with some uh, formal model or formal uh, uh, approach to. to to do some checking on, on their system. We should try to keep the overall consistency of the system. I, I really just talk about the functional layer here, I mean, at the different functional components. But at the same time, I think that, uh, you know, we need also to look at uh, uh, how, this will con how this will be able to connect with the decisional part of the system. 
this usual part they are mostly okay except for the for the for the learn for the learning part uh, which remain a challenge research agenda i mean Again, I will, I, will I will advocate that we should focus on complex systems because they are already here and we need to address this problem. We, sh we should get deeper model with better link with the, between the functional and decision level. Uh, of course, we should address the validation and verification of a learned model as it was uh, mentioned by the, the previous speaker. And also, we should also take into account the human. I mean, validating a system where human is in the loop is already is also a problem. And I'm done. Thanks for your attention. And yeah, this is actually the list of people who are participating. And all the code you saw, I mean, the, the code which is running on the robot and also the, 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 framework, the formal framework which are being used, everything is open source. Uh, no, I wanted the slide back, please. <laughs> Just so they, so they can see the drawing, <laughs> the cartoons. Sorry, thanks again. We have, we have the time for just one question. Uh, do you have any question for uh, Felix? No? Uh, I have one, uh, okay. <laughs> of course. Uh, you, well, um, in order to apply the methodology, do we are obliged to use a genome or not? Well, yes, that's actually the drawback. I mean, the, the point, I mean, I'm, first of all, I mean, this tool was developed by roboticity, and when they did it, they never really thought that they, it was going to be able to, it was going to be uh, something useful for validation and verification. But in fact, uh, it's a, it appears to be, I mean, it appears to be so strict and you know, with a semantic which is very clear in its implementation, but it's actually quite easy to make a formal, a formal model of it. But if you are using, I mean, but you could be using both. There are a bunch of other, you know, robotic system which could be used. ROS by itself, for example, I mean, everybody's talking about ROS. ROS by itself doesn't have enough, uh, you know, structure and how you organize and how you implement things. And it's actually the, the middleware of ROS and the, the, the way the communication is done is actually quite complex to, uh, to, to model because it's, 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 it's it is indeed quite complex, but uh, that's another story. But yes, for now, if you want to do this, you will have to use genome. But as soon as you do it, I mean, for example, for example we did it with Stereo for their uh, Easy 10 vehicle. Then, you know, as soon as you do it, then you get automatically this uh, formal model for free, and then you can play with uh, validation and verification. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> so the next. Uh